We are seeing the war for men's minds, not as a battle of truth against lies, but as a lasting alliance pledged in faith with all those millions driving forward to create the true new order, the world order of the people first, the people before all. In a democratic society, the theory is that if the political leadership has committed the war, they present reasons and they got a very heavy burden of proof to meet because a war is a very catastrophic affair as this one proved to be. Uh, the role of the media at that point is to uh, allow is to present the relevant background, for example, the possibilities of peaceful settlement, such as what they may be, have to be presented, and then to present, uh, to offer a forum, in fact, encourage a forum of debate over this very dread decision to go to war and, in this case, kill hundreds of thousands of people and leave two countries wrecked and so on. Uh, that never happened. Uh, the, there was never, uh, well, you know, when I say never, I mean 99.9% .9 of the discussion uh, excluded the option of a peaceful settlement. That Washington's Office of War Information calls one of the most vital and constructive tasks of this war. This is a people's war, and to win it, the people ought to know as much about it as they can. This office will do its best to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, both at home and abroad. The first weapon in this worldwide strategy of truth is the great machine of information represented by the free press with its powers of molding public thought and leading public action with all its lifelines for the exchange of new ideas between fighting nations spread across the earth. And every time George Bush would appear and say there will be no negotiations, there would be you know, 100 editorials the next day lauding him for going the last mile for diplomacy. Uh, if he said, uh, you can't reward an aggressor, instead of cracking up in ridicule the way people did in civilized sectors of the world, like the whole third world, uh, the media said, oh man, a fantastic principle, you know, the invader of Panama, the only head of state uh, stands condemned for aggression in the world. The uh, guy was head of the CIA during the Timor aggression, you know. He says aggressors can't be rewarded. The media just applauded. The motion picture industry, with its worldwide organization of newsreel camera crews, invaluable for bringing into vivid focus the background drama and perspectives of the war. Mobilized, too, in this all-out struggle for men's minds, by the radio networks, with all their experience in the swift reporting of great occasion and event. From every strategic center and frontline stronghold, their reporters are sending back the lessons of new tactics, new ways of war. The result was it's a media war. I mean, there's tremendous fakery all along the line. Uh, the UN is finally living up to its mission, you know, wondrous sea change, the New York Times told us. The only wondrous sea change was that for once the United States didn't veto a Security Council resolution against aggression. People don't want a war unless you have to have one. And they would have known that you don't have to have one. Well, the media kept people from knowing that. Uh, and that means we went to war very much in the manner of a totalitarian state thanks to the media subservience. That's the big story. Now, remember, I'm not talking about a small radio station in Laramie. I'm talking about the national agenda-setting media. If you're on a radio news show in Laramie, chances are very strong that you pick up what was in the Times that morning and you decide that's the news. In fact, if you follow the AP wires, you find that in the afternoon, they send across tomorrow's front page of the New York Times. That's so that everybody knows what the news is. And the perceptions and the perspectives and so on are sort of transmitted down, and not to the precise detail, but the general picture is pretty much transmitted elsewhere. The foreign news comes here to the foreign news desk. The editor is Bob Hanley. Bob, I suppose you uh, get far more foreign news than you can possibly use in the paper. Yes, we do. We get a great deal more than we can accommodate in a day. And your, your job is to weed it out, I suppose. This is the selection center, as it were. And uh, when I have selected it, I pass it across the desk to one or the other of these sub-editors. It comes back to me, and on this chart, I design the page. That is page one and page two. Fine, Bob. Thank you very much. Why do you want to make a film about media? Well... Such a nice, quiet town. It's a beautiful town. 
Well, we're making a film about the mass media, so we thought, whatever, oh, yeah. what a good place you to come. You want to know where they got the name? So maybe you could start by introducing yourself. Yes, I'm Bowden Senko. I'm the Main Street Manager and the Executive Director of the Media Business Authority. And we are in Media, Delaware County, uh, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania. Media is called Everybody's Hometown. The motto was developed as a way to promote the community. We're a very high promotion conscious community. When you walk through media, you'll be treated very well, and you find that people have taken the idea of being everybody's hometown to heart. The uh, local paper, the um, talk of the town. The town talk. <laughs> do you read that? Uh, yes, I read the town talk, yes. What, what do you think the difference is between the Wall Street Journal and the, town, the talk? Oh, of the... well, I mean, the town talk is completely local news, and uh, it, it's fun, it's nice to read, it's interesting. You read about your neighbors and see what's going on in the school district and things like that. We're in business make bucks just like the big daily newspapers and just like the big radio stations and we do quite well and rightfully so because we work very hard at it i just want to show you a copy of the paper here the way it is this week it's, it's, it's plastic wrapped on all four sides weatherproof and hung on everybody's front door and many many times you'll find that this paper runs well over 100 pages a week this particular edition, you have to remember there are five editions. This happens to be the Central Delaware County edition, which is the edition that covers Media Pennsylvania. What you see here now is the Advertising and Composition Department. Say hello, guys, will you? Hi. Hi. Hi uh, and what we're doing now is we're putting red dots, green dots, and yellow dots up on the map, wherever there is a store. Now, the red dots are the stores that don't advertise with us at all. The green dots are the ones that advertise with us every week, and the yellow dots are the ones that would run sporadically. Now, we have computer printouts of every one of these stores, and what we do is we take the printouts of all the red dots, which are the bad guys, and what our idea is is to turn these red dots into yellow dots and turn the yellow dots into green dots and eventually make them all green dots so 100% of the stores and 100% of the merchants and the service people advertise in our newspaper every week. That way we won't have any more red dots. I guess there'll always be a few red dots, but I have high hopes that there'll be a lot more green ones or red ones when we're finished. Hi, I'm Jim Morgan. I'm with the Corporate Relations Department of the New York Times, and I'm here to take you on a tour of the New York Times, so let's begin. So, they're just taking audio uh, in here. Yeah, they're taking audio in here. Audio. No cameras, no still. We went over this quite thoroughly. They don't even take a still camera in here. So we're in the composing room. This is where the pages are composed. This is the typographical area. What's the ratio of um, news to advertising? 60% ads. Um, this might seem uh, uh, big, but uh, it, it is average, in fact, below average. Our 60% might include, on some days, maybe uh, 20 pages of classified advertising all to itself, where the rest of the newspapers weighted much heavier news to advertising. But the paper, in its entirety, every day, large or small, is 60 ads, 40 news. Well, that uh, completes our tour of the New York Times, and I hope you found it uh, informative, and uh, I hope uh, that you uh, read the New York Times uh, every day of your life from now on. Now, there are other media, too, whose basic social role is quite different. It's diversion. There's the, the real mass media, the kinds that are aimed at, you know, the guys who, Joe Sixpack, that kind. The purpose of those media is just to dull people's brains. This is an oversimplification, but for the 80% or whatever they are, the main thing for them is to divert them, to get them to watch National Football League and to worry about, uh, you know, mother with child with six heads or whatever you pick up in the, uh, you know, in the thing that you pick up on the supermarket stands and so on. Uh, or, you know, look at astrology or get involved in, you know, fundamentalist, uh, stuff or something or just get them away you know get them away from things that matter uh, and for that it's important to uh, reduce their capacity to think the sports section is handled in another special department the sports reporter must be a specialist in his knowledge of sports he gets his story right at the sporting event and often sends it into his paper play by play takes a sport that's another crucial example of the indoctrination system in my view uh, for one thing, because it 
You know, it, it offers people something to pay attention to uh, that's of no importance, that keeps them from worrying about, you know, keeps, them, keeps them from worrying about things that matter to their lives that they might have some idea about doing something about. And in fact, it's striking to see the intelligence that's, that's used by ordinary people in sports. I mean, you listen to radio stations where people call in. They have the most exotic information and uh, understanding about you know, all kind of arcane issues. And the press undoubtedly does a lot with this. I remember in high school already, I was pretty old, I suddenly asked myself at one point, why do I care if my high school team wins the football game? I mean, I don't know anybody on the team, you know. I, I, I mean, they have nothing to do with me. I mean, why am I cheering for my team? It doesn't mean it make any sense, you know. Uh, and, but the point is, it does make sense. It's a way of building up irrational attitudes of submission to authority and, you know, group cohesion behind, uh, you know, leadership elements. In fact, it's training in irrational jingoism. That's also a feature of uh, competitive sports. I think if you look closely at these things, I think they have, typically they do have functions. And that's why energy is devoted to supporting them and creating a basis for them and advertisers are willing to pay for them and so on. I'd like to ask you a question essentially about the methodology in studying the propaganda model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. Uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, history doesn't offer true controlled experiments, but it often comes pretty close. Uh, so one can find uh, uh, atrocities or abuses of one sort that on the one hand are committed by official enemies and on the other hand are committed by uh, friends and allies or by the favored state itself, by the United States in the U.S. case. And the question is whether the media accept the government framework or whether they use the same agenda, the same set of questions, the same criteria for uh, dealing with the two cases as any honest outside observer would do. If you think America's involvement in the war in Southeast Asia is over, think again. The Khmer Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the Killing Fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, 1975 to, through 1978. That atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Have you ever heard of a place called East Timor? I uh, can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. No, huh? Well, it happens that right at that time there was another atrocity, very similar in character, but differing in one respect. We were responsible for it, not Pol Pot. Hello, I'm Louise Penny, and this is Radio Noon. If you've been listening to the program fairly regularly over the last few months, you'll know East Timor has come into the conversation more than once particularly when we were talking about foreign aid and also the war and a new world order. People wondered why, if the UN was serious about a new world order, no one was doing anything to help East Timor. The area was invaded by Indonesia in 1975. There are reports of atrocities against the Timorese people. And yet Canada and other nations have consistently voted against UN resolutions to end the occupation. Today, we're going to take a closer look at East Timor, what's happened to it, and why the international community is doing nothing to help. One of the people who have been most active is Elaine Bruyere, a photojournalist from British Columbia. She's the founder of the East Timor Alert.